morning. It is officially Christmas week. I have enjoyed preparing for this sermon. Like I have, I have loved this whole series. Uh, coming into, you always try to do something fun as you lead into the Christmas season. And uh, I think I said this when we first started it. Sometimes you do your standalone Christmas service because, you know, you don't want it to interrupt a series that you're doing. But like this whole reading of a the sermon written by Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes has been fun for me. Like I've really enjoyed reading it, studying it more. And today's even better because everybody should know this, at least anybody my age and older, because you've seen Footloose. And you see Kevin Bacon get up there and speak his piece about Ecclesiastes 3, and there's a time for everything, and a time to dance. So it's not John Voigt. Who was the, um, um, shoot, who's the actor that plays the, the, the preacher? Oh, I love him. But anyway, John Lithgow. John Lithgow tells him that there's a time to dance, and uh, ultimately trying to get them to lift up their ban on dancing uh, for their own reasons. But we have, we have been on this, this whole book talking about this sermon that Solomon, because that's what it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a letter, but it's a sermon. Like he has, read, he has written this down. He is speaking it out for the generation that he was talking to then and the generations that we're living in now and the ones to come. Because Solomon, who was the wisest of all people ever to walk this earth besides Jesus, is telling us, I've done it. I've been there. I've done that. Please don't do it. You're wasting time. Everything that you have, you have gone out, like we, we were so, uh, I mean, just out front with his wordings in the second week as we were talking, like he says, it is meaningless. Life is meaningless. Everything that you've pursued is meaningless. All the work, all the success, all the achievement, everything, the wealth, the status, all that you went after is meaningless. Solomon, that, that's how he starts this great sermon. Like, I don't know if a lot of people would come back into church if we started looking at him and say, it's meaningless. Your life is meaningless right now. But sometimes that's what it takes. And Solomon is writing this letter. And, and I think I said it in the beginning, like this is coming towards the end of Solomon's life, at the end of all his achievement, at the end of all his success. <clears throat> he is looking back on all of it. And he is saying the, 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 the hills and the valleys, the falls and the slips that he's made. And he's coming out and he's saying all of this. And I, and I, I think I let it off because I had done a funeral that week. And I said that I asked that question to everybody that why does death make us think? Why is it when death enters our life do we start thinking uh, uh, about eternity? We start thinking about the legacy that we're leaving. And so Solomon writes this sermon to tell us, you can avoid it if you just listen to me. On Friday, which is our Christmas service, 7 o'clock, if we don't have a whole bunch of snow, right, Denny, elementary school, <clears throat> I'll give you, I, 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 I'm not going to tell you today. I'm going to tell you at the end what Solomon says that we must do. <laughs> it's so simple. It's two things. It's absolutely so simple. It's just two things he says at the very end of his letter uh, that he says. But he writes all of this stuff. And, and there, there's that in chapter 3, in the beginning, <clears throat> he comes out and talks about time. 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 Time is like the great equalizer. Time is the great e No, none of us can escape time. I don't care how much working out you do. I don't know, care how much surgery you got. I don't care. Uh, time catches all of us since the beginning of time, since uh, Adam and Eve chose to, to eat from the tree of knowledge and, 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 and pretend to be like God. God, that was part of our discipline. God said, listen, from the earth you came, from the earth you'll go back to. I mean, it, it's from, the, from that point. You know, you know, do you know that... Us, that was not God's intent from the get-go. God's intent was not for that to be. It was a decision that we chose. And so when you look at time as the great equalizer, I mean, think 365 day, days a year, besides not counting leap years, let's, let's, let's not mess the math up with the leap year. And then what it's a, a hour, there's 8,760 hours in those years. There's minutes, 525,600 minutes in a year. Great song. Um, and then what is, it's 31 million, 536,000 seconds. Like there's a lot of time. And so my question to you, especially in the context of what Solomon has been challenging us to think is, what have you done with your time? What are you doing with your time? What, 
this great endurance race that we're all on, this endurance race that, that Paul tells us that we're all running, this journey of life, what does your pathway look like? What does your race look like up until this point? What, what, what's the game of life? I talked about that in a previous sermon, like the game of life, and you play a board game with the kids, and I know when you play board games with the kids, you try to get them over as fast as you can. They can't hear me. You know, you want to entertain, you want to do the good thing, but you want to get it over fast. But be careful how much you ask that, because man, those things go by real fast. The next thing you know, those kids are huge. Changes everything, right? And then you start looking at time. What did you do? I get that reminder from an awesome spouse all the time, like your kids aren't going to ask to play with you all the time. Like one day, they're going to walk in and not want to play. Oh, it's a heartbreaker. And especially when you come home from work after being with kids all day and you want to go sit on the couch and watch TV, veg out, watch a game. But you got a little dude that just wants to play with his, with his superheroes and lay on the floor. And you're just like, I don't want to get on the floor. My back hurts. My legs hurt. My knees hurt. Right? But it really, it's those moments that put time into context. Because those moments, if you have older kids, you know don't last forever. And so sometimes, sometimes it is an honor to work with kids because you get to see the development in kids. And you're like, wow, that's just crazy. Like, like five years ago, you were a freshman, you know, and like, it's just, it's, it's, it's wild to especially see that it's, and, and I don't want us to, to focus. It's not a matter of how fast I, don't, I want you to think about this. It's not about, I don't want to just focus on the, the snapshot of it. I also want to focus on your daily life, like how fast you want to achieve something, how fast you want to go get something. Like a lot of times are a lot of your prayers to God, like, come on, God, like how much longer I got to wait? Like, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Like, how, uh, ours was how, God, like, I really want to be, uh, we want a baby now. Like, I didn't want one before. Now we want one. Like, how much longer you want this to go? I mean, uh, success. God, I have been down low for so long. Can you just give me a bone? Like, how, what, what are you trying to teach me down here? Those are common questions that Christians and non-Christians alike ask all the time, like, how long do I have to stay in this season? Um, like, when you think about, like, Christmas season in general, in my line of work, Bob's line of work, you know, um, like, this is a very joyful season for me, for, 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 for many. This season's terrible. For a lot of families, this is a terrible season of life to be in. As soon as you get to October and you move into Halloween and you move into Thanksgiving and then you move into uh, Christmas and then you move past that into New Year's and then flowing right on into Easter. Easter you usually come out of the dark a little bit. But we know in my line of work that that's, that's, that's t- some tough times for some people. Like sometimes it just doesn't go well and it isn't right. You know what I'm saying? Like it gets hard. And so... Uh, it's not a matter of how fast you accomplish something. That's kind of what we're talking about here and what he gets into, and I'll give it to you later, or how you do something, right? It's, it's not what I want you to focus on through the whole thing, but what are you doing with the time that you have and the time that you've been given? Or do you spend more time complaining about your time in that season? I know I did a lot of time complaining about certain seasons of my life. I can tell you now through maturity, through spiritual maturity, because honestly, God is the only lens that can make it make sense. Because there are seasons in our life that you will look at and you are like, why is that even necessary? Why was that moment in time necessary? Because I don't know any bad people in this room right now. And so you look at it like, God, is this a form of discipline? Is this, what did I do to deserve this? And I promise you, it is only through the lens of Jesus Christ that it will ever make sense to you. Because I can go, I can stand from a, a position now, and I can look back through the lens of Christ, you know, through the perspective of the cross, and I can be like, I got you, I got you. Because what he was doing then was preparing me for what I'm doing now. Or what he, what he did then is preparing you for something way in the future. I, I always will say this. It's our scars that God will use. God didn't make anybody perfect. He expected you to go out here and screw up. But what he said is that we're a church, and a church is a collective of, of, of people. It's not a building. It's a collection of people that love God. That's, what it, that's a church, right? And if you love God, 
you got to love what God loves and God loves people. And so what God says is that none of you are perfect. He says, what I want to happen is I want that scar of yours one day. I want it just to come open just a little bit because that scar that you have will help that person right there. That's what God wants from us. That's what that's when you look at time. Those are the things you got to look at. Those are the things that you have to see. That's how you have to kind of examine it. And when I think of uh, like the coming of Christ, just to put this into context with our Christmas story and where Solomon's writing his, is think about how long Israel waited for Jesus. They waited. He was foretold since the beginning of time. Jesus, 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 the Messiah, a Savior will come. And he will provide a way. He will be with you. He will walk with you. I mean, a matter of fact, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Not even just the Messiah. They will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel, God with us. You know that that prophecy was made 700 years before Jesus was born. I don't know about you. I don't got the patience for 700 years let alone the reality that I make it that long. You know, <laughs> think about that. When you think of the context of some of the things that God says and does for us, time's not a thing to God. Time's a thing for us. And time is often what trips us up. It's not just the, the apprehension or fear or doubt and believing in Jesus. It's you don't want to trust him with your time. A lot of us have this idea, this misconception that I'm in control. I'm in control of my world and ain't nobody can mess it up. You tell me you control your calendar to a, you, know, you can have the best calendar in the world, but I can promise you God can mess that bad boy up in a heartbeat. He can make things go wrong. He can prove a point. He can, he can, I mean, he can, man, he can make it all make sense. And here we are, there, Israel's waiting for the prophecy of a Messiah. We're waiting for a prophecy of a Messiah to return to us, are we not? He's coming back one day. He'll come like a thief in the night. We'll never know. Never know when he's coming. So don't let that slip either, that thinking that you've got all the time in the world, because you don't know. Each one of us, our time is marked. God knows when he's taken us. And you never know when, him, when your time might be. That's not a morbid or scary thing. That's something that you need to know that God's got a plan for you and time is not to be wasted. Time's not to be wasted. I mean, 700 years could you stay committed? Think about some of the things that we lack commitment in now. Lack commitment in, 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 in the longevity, the long game of your finances. I remember when Carrie started that whole plot of digging us out of our youthful, terrible, awful financial messes that we made of our life early on because we wanted to keep up with everybody and we wanted to live a lifestyle and we wanted to have fun and, you know, which dug us a hole that was insurmountable to me because money just crushes my soul. Like I am not a money person at all. I don't like it. I'm so grateful. My son, I think I shared this, my son's challenged me, didn't even know, like, Dad can do a check. I was like, yes, I can write a check. <laughs> there was a time before your mother, I could keep a checkbook, I can do that, I'd go to the bank. But I remember that, and I remember when Carrie set off to kind of straighten it out. She came up with a plan, she had been doing some studying, and I remember how insert, like, that seemed like, oh, like, it seemed so hard in that season to think, like, and the time that it took. And you know what, it took a long time. It was a, I can't remember how long the plan was. Like she had a binder. We still have it. She keeps it. I love it. I love it that she still has the binder. It's a pink binder. Is it the pink one? It's the pink one. She still keeps it. It has our bills marked out and, and the goals every way to check it off. And I'm, I have such an appreciation for it now. But I'll tell you, in the beginning of that season, I had so much doubt. I was like, there's no way I can commit to this. Like she had our bills broken down from when she got paid to when I got paid, how much would be left over, how much extra we're putting towards this to get past this, the sacrifices that were made to get that. The gro we had the grocery bill in there, like a projected grocery bill. Like, let you do it. Where's, where's McDonald's in there? Where's, where's, where's Madden in August? I need to make sure I get that in August. 
You know, like it was like it's crazy. But I think of like her foresight and and planning and prepping. And I want to say it took what it took us years. Five years, I think it was a five-year plan. It was a five-year plan to, to to get where we needed to be. And I remember when we got to the end of that season, I was like, "Holy wow, we we did it! That's crazy!" Like, think about those things that you're in your life right now, and those seasons, and the time that it takes to accomplish what you're trying to get through. Like, we we pick at children all the time, teenagers, but we're no different. Teenage, teenagers don't see the long game. Neither do we. We don't see the long game. Because when we're adults, we know best. We do whatever we want. I mean, 700 years to wait for the Messiah. I can't wait in a line. Don't put me in traffic. Oh my gosh. I avoid traffic like the plague. Like, I want to get away. Like, the plague's not even that. Like, I avoid the traffic like COVID. Like, I try to get you. Know, like, traffic drives me nuts. <laughs> Think about Christmas season. And you go, how. how how generous are you guys when you go strolling into the stores to go get stuff? Heck, if you even go to the store anymore, you go to Amazon, we'll have it to you next day. But when you go in there and you see the crowds of people and, and it's just crowded and you're crushed and the lines are ridiculous and then you're like, why aren't there any, why isn't that register open? And they're like, well, we don't have enough people working because nobody wants to work anymore. And, and like all these different problems, right? I mean, th these are real problems. And we get frustrated with just those simple things. Can you wait 700 years? I mean, think about you as an individual. Can you wait? Do you even understand why you're waiting? And here's the thing that I want you to think about that kind of Solomon is planting this seed. The seed that he's planting is that time has its purpose. And that there's a time for everything. But in the time is the grooming, the making, and the creating, and the prepping, and the building, and the tearing down, and the fixing, and the correcting. It's in the time that, that God's working, that God is working. It's, we miss that when we rush it, when we rush it and we skip the work. Being a Christian is work, because you're continually to work towards a better you, and being what he wants you to be. I mean, none of us were born righteous. And not, it's not about being righteous. It's about pursuing righteousness. It's about choosing to pursue, to be in right standing with God. None of us are born holy. It's about pursuing holiness. God doesn't want perfection. He wants progression. He wants you to continue to get better. And that happens in time. We miss what God is trying to tell us. It's the character he is trying to build within us or the season he is trying to prepare us for in the future. Sometimes the things that you experienced in your youth were just preparation for the, the instance that you're gonna to have to deal with, even if it's just an ice. See, sometimes we think that it's pre preparation for some big, massive thing. What if what he prepared you for there was something that's gonna help you deal with your kid? Or what if he prepared you for then, that season you were in, was just going to prepare you for one person that you would have contact with him later? Because even the one is important to Jesus, right? Maybe what he prepared you for then or the season he kept you in then will put you in front of a whole bunch of people. You'll start some kind of company or something that actually fulfills or helps or does. But none of it, regardless of how big or how small it is, minimizes what God has done inside you and what he's done for you. God has a plan. It doesn't matter the success, the failures, the highs, the lows, the victories, the losses, the wealth, the little, uh, celebrating the morning. Believe it or not, morning has its time. There's a time for it all. In Ecclesiastes 3, this is that, that famous scripture that you get uh, in Footloose. Sorry, I keep, I, I love Footloose. I'm just going to be honest. I love Footloose. There is a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search 
and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to to tear and a a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Like he is addressing just about a multitude of things that we all feel throughout the time frame of our life. Solomon comes out and says there's a time for it all. There's a time for it all. Every season has its reason. And I know that a lot of people get hung up on like hate. Hate has its thing. Hate is just something like you can't ignore. That there are things like God hates specific sin. It's in scripture. But there's a time to move past it too. There's a time to love. Like those are different things that you have to think about. There's every season has its reason and you may never understand it. That's the other thing. That sometimes we will get stuck in a season because we're trying to understand the season rather than work through the season. You gotta, you you gotta be ready to do the work. You gotta be ready to just keep pushing on. And I, and I, and 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 the best way that I could try and wrap this up for us so that you can understand it is again, time is not a thing for God. Time's a thing for us. But if you just understand that the, 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 our great heavenly father is in control of that time, then you know that he's watching the time for you. Second Peter 3, 8 says this, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Time doesn't matter to God. He can stop it if he wants to. My favorite book in the Bible, Joshua, he made the sun stand still so that Israel could overcome. You can spend time trying to figure that out. How do you make the sun stand still? Or you can just believe that God can do whatever he needs to do to get what he wants out of you. Because that's how he is. Time isn't a problem for him. It's a problem for us. And we don't accept the fact that it's borrowed time in the first place. It's borrowed time in the first place. What he gave, he can take. And it's not to to make you think that, oh man, tomorrow might be the day. It might be. Or it might not. You might have 50 more years to go. You know, and we can spend time with the, dealing with the sadness and the overcoming of losing young people or using people, losing people untimely or, you know, doing funerals and stuff. You try to, 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 to remind people or pick the, the legacy of a person and, and what did they do with the time that they had? If you started thinking about the fact that your time is borrowed in the first place, you would think a lot more about the time that you spent and what you did with the time that you had. Time is precious. But time is borrowed. Further on in Ecclesiastes, I mean, we all, everybody stops at that first section. But man, you know, scripture just keeps going. So you keep going and you get to some good stuff. What do workers gain from their toil? Remember, we're going into that meaningless talk that that Solomon kept saying. I mean, these are all sarcastic questions that he keeps asking. I mean, I would love, like, this is, I can't do a good interpretation sometimes when they're asking sarcastic questions. Like, what would you, what do you gain from the toil? From your toil. I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Did you know that you are searching that empty space? I love talking to people that don't believe in Jesus. The empty space that you have, the searching thing that you are trying to fill, the void that you are substituting with things, people, relationships, whatever it may be, that void is right here. The answer is right there. He has set eternity in the human heart. Your heart will continue to search for him because I know that when you receive Jesus Christ, Jesus said that I will give you, that I will give you the Holy Spirit. It says that he will enter our heart. He will be with us. He is God with us. Emmanuel, he has set eternity in human heart. This is in the Old Testament, guys. This isn't even talking about Jesus yet. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Remember, Solomon said, enjoy it. Life should be enjoyed because it's borrowed. Do good. Enjoy your work. What's the sense in working if you hate it? 
I'm not saying be lazy and not get a job. What I'm saying is find something that you love and do it. And do it as though you're doing it for the Lord. Whether you're making hamburgers or serving tables or teaching students. Or if you started going into your jobs with a different mindset, it changes everything about the job. My job changed when I started looking at even criminals a lot as children of God. My job changed for me and everything I did. The compassion that I had for human beings changed. I've seen terrible things. I've seen people do terrible things to people and kids. And, but when you start looking at people, I will tell you this right now. What I do now in my job, that it's not easy, but God has given me the ability to do it because he prepped me in a season, is now when I look at people that have done wrong, I always look for the cause because cause and effect, something got you here. You made a terrible choice. I mean, Cain and Abel, they killed, uh, he killed his brother. That's the first murder. The, 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 the siblings. I mean, it's all bad, but th there's cause. There's things that got us there. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. The work that you do is a gift of God. The family that you have, the relationships that you keep, the possessions that you obtain, the, the goals that you have, these are things that God has given you as a gift to pursue in your life. Because God wants you to have peace. He wants you to have hope. He wants you to have love. He wants you to have all those things. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him, which is what we'll get to on Friday. Fear, I don't want you to, to get caught up in that fear is different. Fear is a, a healthy thing to have when, when it's done in the context of Scripture. Time is an ultimate gift of God. Time is a gift of God. And that's what I like. I love. Uh, where is that? Where is it? Everything is beautiful in its time. And where, where did I put my Scripture? I think it was the first one, but it's, it's, it's all a gift, a toil, gift of God. I, I just, I highlighted that over and over and over in my Bible, that, that it is a gift of God. That season where life really sucked, it was a gift of God. Because that season that really sucked made me a better husband. That season that really sucked Help me be a better dad. That terrible experience I had at work where I failed made me a better policeman. I mean, think about your own. I tell you there's a reason for every season. And, and sometimes it takes forever. And you're like, God, how much longer does life got to be like this? And he said, I'm not done with you yet. Because remember, time's not a thing for him. It's a, time, it's a thing for us. He's got you. What he started in you, he will finish. I mean, he will finish it. He, he, he has started something in each and every one of you. And his timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. And so like Israel waited 700 years. But God knew the time and the place that he was going to enter this world. He knew that he would be here for 33 years. He knew when he would begin his short ministry of three years. And he knew what he was going to do with you. His timing is perfect. His promises never expire. That's the hope. Is that his promises never expire. While our time will run out on this planet and one day we will, we will, we will leave the, our, our earthly bodies, his promises ring true. His promises never expire. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, done. We've seen that, right? He's overcome our sin by taking up that cross. He sent the Holy Spirit to us. He's preparing a place for you and me. And then he promised he's coming back. So far, if I went through and checked off the promises that he's accomplished, they're not expired yet. I love this quote from Lou Giglio. Um, uh, one of my favorite pastors to, to listen to speak. He says, if you're, true, if you're truly waiting on God, if you're truly waiting on God, you won't miss anything. When you walk with God, 
you always arrive on time. God's timing is perfect. It's us that wants to rush it. It's us. I mean, think about moments when you superseded God and you were like, you know, I'm just going to make it happen right now. And you jumped into the relationship before it was time. Think how chaotic it was. Timing was, I thought my timing was good. It was terrible. Terrible. Absolutely. Like, I look forward to teaching marriage classes someday because, like, time, when you do it outside of his context, when you push it, it's you it, you can make or break and at some point in your relationships there's a, like you either you you got to fight for what you got and I, like I literally looked like we rushed we, we pushed we rushed and it wasn't right you know and, and, and there was a terrible season for that but God works through it God does amazing things I think of things I've pushed and forced at work when God said you're not ready for it you're not ready for that but think about that. You push for the advancement. Maybe you took some shortcuts and you and you cut some backs and, and cut some corners and, and, and to try and achieve something and sacrifice some of your, your morality to get what you wanted out of it. And then on the back end of it, you're like, oh my gosh, what did I do? If you just wait for God's perfect timing, God says, I have something in store for you that you can now, you can't even imagine what I'm going to do through you. But we rush it. 700 years. 700 years and he finally came. That prophecy that was made 700 years prior in Matthew we see it come. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you, and you, Oh, shoot, I lost my mind. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. 700 years they waited. 700 years was nothing to God. 700 years he sat up there and watched Israel struggle. 700 years he watched that, that kingdom fractured. 700 years he watched father and son screw up a kingdom, redeem a kingdom, get it back in check with God. 700 years he watched the, it go up and down and back and forth. But he knew the day and the time that he was going to enter the flesh. His timing is perfect. Prophecy fulfilled. That's what, if we would just trust his... The scripture speaks of this, and this is where I'll close and send us off. Scripture speaks of this, and this is what I believe Solomon is saying. Solomon wants you to know, wanted us to know, that there's a time for everything. And there's a time for it all. Sometimes it really sucks. It's just not right. I probably shouldn't say that word all that, but that's just the word. It's, like, it's just what it is. You can't, you can't doctor it up. Nobody likes to lose somebody. Nobody likes to watch somebody go through a season where they're losing their life. Nobody likes to, to see those rough seasons when you don't have a lot or, you, or life is just a true struggle. We all wish that we had the Christmas season where it was just cheerful and great and everything's nice. That's not the reality of it all. That there is moments of struggle, there is moments of shortage, there is moments of hardship and heartbreak and all those things. But all of those things work for the betterment of who we are. Some great folks in this scripture give me hope in, in, in this Bible because of the hardships that they experience, yet they continue to keep God in the perspective. They continue to focus on God. And some of them went off track just like we do. But then they went back. Because they knew, they knew who the true north point was, like who their true center was, who was going to be their God. Scripture is not about perfection. Again, I can't say enough. It's not about perfection. It's about progression. It's to continue to get better. John fourteen twenty seven says, "The peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives." This is Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The secret to peace that scripture continually speaks about is trusting God's timing. That his timing is perfect. 
and he knows best. It's not for us to figure out why. It's not for us to to marinate on why this season right now is terrible. It's for us to, to rely on him through the time, through that season, and trust him. And when you're in those seasons that you just don't get, that's he puts you there so that you lean in, not so that you back away. When you're in that valley, he wants you to lean in. That, I mean, like we all need those seasons because if life was perfect and great all the time and there was no mourning and there was no down times, then we would be not, we wouldn't need God. We'd think we're God. God needs to get you where he wants you. And sometimes he's got to put you in those seasons and extend that time because he's building something great. It, true peace comes from trusting his timing. And know this that your time will come. That is something that to hold on to, like your time will come. I don't know what your time looks like. I don't know how long you'll be here, but your time will come because God already knew what he had in store for you. That's the peace that you have to have. That's the peace to, how do I go into terrible situations? I, I can tell you that snapshot decisions you make in my youth as a police officer, like I was afraid. Like yeah, there's moments I've been scared. I can tell you now, I'm not saying it's bravery. I'm saying that when I go into situations, and I don't, I don't do that much anymore in the school, but um, my thought process going into situations after I came awake was like I would pray, all right, God, because I knew that what, I'm here, and I know because I believe that you have me here for a reason, and let's just do this. Let's do everything that you've prepped me for at this moment, and I'll do my best, and I know that you got this. I mean, that... That's the, the daily thing that we should have in all our lives. That nothing is an accident for God. Nothing is an accident for God. His timing is perfect. Whether it's 700 years, three years, two hours, five minutes, two seconds, doesn't matter. God knew it. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for an understanding. I pray that we can start leaning in closer to you to understand the, the time of each of our lives. That whatever season we're in right now, Father, that you have a reason for that, that season. And Father, rather than searching for these answers, not denying help or counsel, but rather than racking our minds and our brains to, to find the, the, the reasons for these seasons, Father, I pray that we can just lean into you. That as we question ourselves, as we go through these seasons, or we mourn, or, or we cry, or we get frustrated, Father, I pray that we lean into your word. That we lean into your word, and Father, that we open up to you, that we're honest about our frustrations, we're honest about how we feel, because you already know anyway. But Father, I pray that we open up that communication, that your timing is perfect, that trusting in your timing will bring us peace. And Father, I pray for that peace for each and every one of us because it's been a rough couple years. And some of us have been able to rebound and come out of it, and some of us may not. And Father, I pray for those that are struggling with that right now, that they can lean in. Father, I thank you for the investment that you've made in me. I thank you for the people that are in this room and that will watch later that are hearing your words, that are hearing the words of Solomon, that you planted that seed in him who, who, who spoke it into future generations. Father, I pray that we hear it loud and clear that there is a time for everything. But we don't use that as an excuse to get stuck because this isn't an endurance race and you want us to keep pushing towards the prize. And Father, you are the prize that we all choose to obtain. We want to be with you in that, up in that house with many rooms in relationship with you where I can bother you with questions and everything I want to know. Father God, I pray for those that are in those seasons of hardship, that Christmas just isn't the time for them. I pray for those that are struggling in relationship. I pray for those that are struggling with employment. I pray for those that are just struggling to figure out what's next. Father, I pray that we lean in and we trust you and we listen and know that you have the best in store for us. Father, you are an incredible father. And I trust you. And I pray that others trust you too. Father God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.